Good morning. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 22, 1 through 14. Now the feast of the unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. And then Saint, Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched, watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them with no, when no crowd was present. Then came the day of the unleavened bread of which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, where is, where is the guest room where, where I may eat at the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Just to let you know this morning, um, we will be taking communion just a little bit later than we normally do uh, in our service, so just to, to be aware of that. Um, I want to sh- remind you all, we have gear up coming up in two weeks. Two weeks from today, we have gear up in about, last, last count, 270 volunteers uh, ready to help and bless many families with school supplies and backpacks and all kinds of services and, and items, and so thankful for you guys and, and what you do in that. I will ask you this. Just please make sure that you let people in your, in your realm that you know, uh, let them know about Gear Up. Make sure that they know uh, that, that needs are going to be met on that day, which is uh, Sunday, the August 4th, the event from 4 to 7, uh, excuse me, 4 to 6. We're asking our volunteers to be there 3 to 7. So please uh, grab, a, grab a, uh, uh, a brochure from the North Foyer. Give it to people you know. Make sure that uh, we bless as many people as we can on that day. So this morning, going to be a little different. Obviously, you came in here and you're like, what is going on? Uh, they've moved the Ark of the Covenant away from the most holy place. Um, we're going to take, we're gonna take you, uh, I ho- hope to be able to take you back to the Last Supper. Uh, we're going to do our best to join Jesus and his disciples around the table that we know to be the Last Supper that Tyler just read to us, and he'll continue in that reading here in just a few minutes. So we want to take you there this morning. You're going to, I'm not going to have every scripture we share up on the screen, so you might get your Bibles ready and your fingers uh, moistened and ready to, ready to rock and roll here in a little while to so some of the scriptures we're going to be turning to. Uh, back, in, back in March, uh, many of you were able to and blessed to be a part of um, uh, the Seder meal we had a friend from, uh, his name is Jeremy Upton. He came from Sycamore View uh, in uh, Memphis, Sycamore View Church of Christ in Memphis. He came up and he walked many of us in the family room through the Seder meal, through Passover and what that looks like. And there are many things about the Passover and some things that he mentioned that just piqued a lot of our interest and were just fascinating things. And a, a few of those things you're going to see, I've, I've, look, I've looked more into and, and we're going to uh, maybe bring you guys to the table a little bit today, okay? Uh, so that's our, that's our goal and our focus here today. Uh, when it comes to the Last Supper, many of you probably have this in mind, as I, as I do, okay? You have this beautiful painting by Leonardo da Vinci called The Last Supper, uh, gorgeous painting, and this may be kind of the setting, this may be what you have in mind of what the Last Supper looked like, okay? Well, yes and no. All right, there are some things about this picture that are probably not real accurate. And hopefully, uh, as we go throughout this morning, you'll, you'll understand uh, some of those inaccuracies, but, but also why it even matters, okay? Um, so the first thing I want to take you to is I want to take you to the table. And it, many of you can see this table here on the stage. I know it's, it's low here, uh, but, but you get a, basically an illustration of what more the table probably looked like at the Last Supper up on the screen as well. 
Um, and what you'll notice about the table and the setting of the table is, first of all, that it's, it's likely a low-lying table, a very low table, often shaped in the shape of a U, okay, with three different sides and with, with cushions around the perimeter, okay? And they call this table, this setting, a triclinium. Um, and, and oftentimes, here's what you would have. You would have the participants in this meal, they would, they would be gathered around the perimeter of this setting, this triclinium, okay? So this is more the setting of the Last Supper. How did they sit at the Last Supper? I want to share with you some, some scriptures here. Uh, many of you guys know that J Jesus, if you read the Gospels, you'll find out that Jesus did what we all love to do a lot, which was he ate. He ate a lot. He ate a lot with different people. And you can see through his, through, through gospel accounts, and particularly, I'm just going to focus on Luke for just a few moments, okay? You can see that there's a certain eating position that he had when he ate, or a certain eating position that they even talked about when they talked about an eating position, okay? So in the book of Luke, if you'll follow me, I'm just going to share a few of these. From chapter 7, verse 36, when Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman, he, it says, reclined at the table. Notice that word reclined, okay? In, in chapter 11, verse 37, Jesus had been invited to a Pharisee's house for dinner, and he, once again, reclined at the table. In Luke chapter 12, verse 37, just a chapter later, Jesus encourages his disciples to stay ready. And here's what he says in verse 37, okay? Here's what he says. He says, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. And then Tyler just shared from the Last Supper, verse 14 is the verse he ended with, and it says this, Jesus, uh, Jesus and his disciples recline at the table. So just to dispel any myths about what this may look like, okay, I think it, I think it uh, good to tell you what this is not. Reclining at the table does not mean that Jesus and his disciples each had a lazy boy recliner kick back, right, eating at the table, which, by the way, would be awesome, all right? Agreed? Agreed? Okay, some of y'all may do that, okay? I'm not judging anybody who does that. I think that's pretty cool. But they're, they're not reclining at the table and they're lazy boy. It looks something quite different from that. Okay, so to eat at such a low table, here's what that would look like, if you'll forgive me for getting down on the ground for just a moment. But what that would look like more likely is they would get down on their left side, left elbow, feet pointed out. They'd be fanned all the way around this table. Feet pointed out, left side, frees up the right arm to eat, if you will. Okay? So that's more the picture of what we have when we have uh, the idea of disciples or Jesus reclining at the table. Now, to do this, okay, for this, for this setting takes up quite a bit of space, more space than I have in my dining room, all right? So for the disciples to be gathered, reclined all around this table takes up quite a bit of space, which is, which is uh, consistent with what Tyler read in verse 13. Because the room that has been prepared for the disciples and for this meal, for this last supper, it describes as an upstairs large room, right? It describes it as a large room. So that's consistent uh, with the seating arrangement and provides space for that. Now, how was everyone seated at this table? You didn't ask, but I just asked the question, okay? How was everyone seated at this table? Now, you may have reserved seating at your home. Uh, you may have assigned seating at your home. You know, dad always sits here. I actually, it just, it just works out that way at our house, not because it's an assigned seat, but I always have a, a, a spot I sit in. Okay, just real quick. How many of y'all always sit in the same seat when you're at, at home eating a meal? Okay, most of you. All right, that's fine. Good deal. Well, it's not necessarily assigned. Some, in some of your families, it might be. It's like, don't sit in that chair. That's for somebody else. Okay, that's fine. But we do somewhat have assigned seats. Um, we, we tend to honor people at our meals if we have guests over. One of, the things, one of the things we will do is we will allow the guests to eat first or, or to go through the line first. If it's some kind of buffet style, let our guests go first, okay? We do that kind of things, and so that way we honor people at our meals. If you've been to a wedding reception, you know what it looks like to honor people at a meal. Because oftentimes, if there's a, a meal going on at the, at the wedding reception, it will, uh, we will have a place for the bride and the groom, a specific place 
By the way, please, if you're a guest at a wedding, don't go take the bride and the groom's seats, okay? That would be kind of awkward because you would have to be asked to leave or, or something. But, but you have the, wet, the, the bride and the groom sitting at a specific place. You may have a wedding party sitting at specific seats. And you may even have some of the uh, more immediate family members sitting at their specific feet, so, seats. So we're familiar with kind of assigned seatings in some way, in some respects, in some places. But here... Around the table, at Passover, at the Last Supper, we can get an idea, putting some pieces together and knowing some things historically, as to where some of the people around this table sat. All right? So y'all follow me for just a minute. We're going to be following this little grid up, up on the screen. Maybe you can see. Okay? So, first of all, the host of a meal, such as this, such as the Last Supper, always sat in the same place. You can be well assured where the host of the meal is sitting at the table. Um, who's the host of this meal? Who's the one who gave instructions to go and prepare for this meal? It was Jesus, right? He's hosting this meal. He's the one calling the shots surrounding this meal. So Jesus is, by all accounts, he's, he's the host of this meal. And the host always sat in a certain spot or reclined at a certain spot. You can see it up on the screen. And it was the second spot from the end, right here. I'm not going to lay down again for you, but it's right here. Je Jesus, Jesus being the host, we could be pretty well assured where he was sitting at this table, which is interesting. Okay. Well, at a, at a table such as this, there's also typically two particular seats of honor. Two seats of honor. Jesus had spoken about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law earlier on in his ministry in not very glowing terms, okay? But he mentions this seat of honor thing, and I just want to take us there. I want to read it to you. Uh, Matthew 23, verses 5 and 6, I'm going to read it for you. I'm in Matthew 23, 5 and 6. He, Jesus says this, everything that they do, he's talk, talking about the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, he says, everything that they do is for show, for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide, their tassels on their garments long. They love the place, catch this, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. Now, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and teachers of the law, and he's, there's nothing wrong with the places of honor at a banquet. What is wrong is with their hearts, the hearts of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because they just, their hearts are totally messed up. And it's all about them. But he points out this idea of these places of honor at the table, and it's something that, that, that they would have been very familiar with, okay, these places of honor at the table. So there's two of them here, two places of honor. The first one is usually to the host's Right, if the host is lying here, the host right beside it, right here on the end, seen up on the screen in the orangish, ugly color that shows up on that screen. I'm sorry if I offended anybody. I didn't mean to. Okay, I'm moving on. Okay, so the first place of honor is usually a trusted friend. And to find out who it is, I want to take us to John 13. I'm going to give you a moment to turn there, okay? I want you to turn to John 13. John tells his account of this same Last Supper, all right? And I want to take us there. Because you need to know what Jesus is about to do in John's account. Jesus is about to drop a bomb at, at the Last Supper table. He's about to make the dinner conversation very awkward. Okay? Some of you guys have been around uh, family tables or tables with friends. Everything's going fine until somebody mentions that. And maybe that is the wrong sports team or politics or something. All of a sudden, everything gets awkward. Jesus is about to drop a bomb here at the table, okay? I'm going to read John 13, starting in verse 21. Jesus says, very truly I tell, of you, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Okay, there's the bomb. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. So leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? 
So we're introduced to a certain person at this table known by John as the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is who, by the way? John. A lot of you guys know your gospels very well. You know that John was known very well as the disciple whom Jesus loved, not to take love away from the other disciples. He had love for each of them, but there was a special love for John, okay? This is pretty obvious as we read the scriptures. So we know that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was in a position at the table to do what? To lean back to talk to Jesus. Now there's only one person at this table who's going to lean back against the host. And who's that going to be? It's going to be the person in front of him on his left side who can lean back and talk to Jesus. So we know that John is in a place, is in the first place of honor at this table. Pretty interesting. John, he he sits in this place of honor. Well, there's still a second place of honor at the table. We continue in our reading in John, and he will tell us a little bit more. Verse 26 of John 13. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now, Only someone sitting very close to or next to Jesus at this meal would be able to share a dipping bowl with Jesus at this meal. Most scholars would tell you and are in agreement when they take in the full picture of all the gospels and all uh, all that's going on here. Most scholars would tell you it's pretty obvious that Judas is the person sitting in the second seat of honor. The second seat of honor is, is behind the host. Up on the screen, you see it in red. That's the second seat of honor. And most would, would agree telling you that second seat of honor was filled by Judas. Now, you need to know something. Here at this Last Supper, uh, it is not known for sure. We don't know for sure whether or not Jesus assigned seats at this table or whether the disciples picked the seats for themselves. But let me say this about that, okay? Most banquets such as this, history tells us, they would typically, the host would typically choose who sits where. At the very least, at the very least, follow me here, at the very least, the host would at least approve of the seating arrangement. There's other instances in Scripture where a host could move someone from one seat to another. All right? Because basically, the honor goes from top to bottom. Seat of honor, the host. Seat of honor. And it usually goes, fans around to the the seat of least honor all the way on the other side. And so a host would usually at least be okay with how everyone is seated and sometimes would even move everyone around. I tend to believe, I tend to believe that Jesus chose these seats of honor at this Last Supper. One of the reasons is because Jesus is always teaching. He's always teaching his disciples something, and there is much to be learned when Jesus takes a Judas and puts him in a place of honor at the Last Supper. So you might say, okay, Jacob, so why does it even matter? What's the big deal? What's what's the point? Okay, so we have a good idea who's sitting where. So what? Well, we cannot miss the fact that likely Judas was seated by Jesus in a place of honor. Judas, the very one, Jesus honors the very one who is going to turn him over for execution later on that evening. No doubt Jesus already knew that Judas would be the betrayer, and he chose to honor him Anyway, now I know where I would have set Judas, okay? If this is is the seat of honor and over there is the least honor, if I allow Judas in the room, it's going to be over there, right? Or, hey, no, Judas, you're you're bringing the food in today. By the way, this U-shape really provides a good area for uh, 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 anyone to serve food uh, inside to the people who are seated on the outside. I'd be like, Judas, you're serving food tonight, buddy. 
or Judas, you're outside with the cats, you know, something. Like, you're not coming in this, this meal with me. That would be my attitude, right? Not to mention something else that the Gospels record happens at this meal that you guys are familiar with. That Jesus, at one point during this meal, he takes a knee, he takes a towel, he takes a water basin, and he goes around disciple, 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 to disciple, and he washes their feet. And it doesn't say that he skipped Judas, but our, our Lord and Master, when he comes to the feet, the gross, ugly, dirty, tainted, traitorous feet of Judas, he washes them. And I know how I would have, I would have used ice water for his feet, right? Like, bring us the ice water, and I would have, I would have dried his feet with 80-grit sandpaper, okay? That's what, I, that's what I would have done, but not Jesus. There's much to be learned. This tells us much about Jesus. I want us to focus a few moments on this meal that these disciples gather to celebrate. Note this. The disciples did not gather at the Last Supper to celebrate in communion. It's not what they came for. The disciples didn't come to celebrate in communion. The disciples came to celebrate what? Passover. That's what they came to celebrate. So I want to take us there for just a few moments, okay? Just learn a few things. There's so much to be learned here, but, but we're just going to focus on a couple things. Passover, this is so cool to me. Passover is the oldest human tradition that's still in existence. Think on that for just a moment. Passover, the oldest human tradition still in existence. Over 3,500 years, people have been practicing Passover, and they still pa- practice it today. 3,500 years of practicing Passover. I think that's just incredible. So a brief history of Passover, in case you're unfamiliar or to bring us up all all to speed and on the same page, let me just mention a couple things about Passover. Somewhere around 1500 B.C., Moses, God calls Moses, who is in a very unique position, by the way, to free the Israelites from their oppression and their slavery in Egypt. The ruler of Egypt, the Pharaoh, proves to be a stubborn to Moses' request to free the Israelites. In a plague, a plague followed each of Pharaoh's refusals. The final plague of 10 was the death of the firstborn. So the death angel would pass over, hence the word Passover, the death angel would pass over the homes of the Israelites, not killing the firstborn, of those who had put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home. The blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home. The Passover meal is a sacred meal that Israel was commanded by God to commemorate and pass along the knowledge of God's actions that led to their exodus from slavery in Egypt. And the observance of this meal places all the participants in present participation. It's as though you're there in the events of the past. You know, there are certain meals in my life and in my family's life that are the same every year. You know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all have this. Some of y'all have Thanksgiving traditions where you always eat the same thing. And people who are there always bring the same thing, same dishes. Uh, one of the things uh, in my family, we go to my mom's house. We call her Grana. I have ever since the kids started uh, 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 when they were young. Uh, we go to Grana's house before Christmas, but we call it Grana Christmas Eve. And at Grana Christmas Eve, all the adults and all who are able all cook something there at Grana's on Grana Christmas Eve, some party food or party snack for the evening's meal. And we've got all kinds of stuff at the meal. And I always cook, I always make my salsa. I always make Chex Mix. Okay, I get out pretty easy, to be honest with you. But I know that, I know that my brother-in-law is going to make sausage balls. And I know that, I mean, there's certain things, and I, I know what to expect at Grana Christmas Eve. You guys can kind of relate in some way, in some area of your life, some meals. They're just always the same. You know what to expect. The disciples, as they gather to this table, the Last Supper, they know what to expect. They've been celebrating Passover ever since they were babies. 
They, they knew the history, they knew the Exodus story frontwards and backwards as it, had be, as it has been recanted and explained to them over and over. They knew it. They knew that every element of this meal, what it stood for and what it represented, because they had been at this meal every year without fail ever since they were little. They knew what to expect. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, he celebrated a Passover tradition that was already some 1,500 years old. By his words at the Last Supper, Jesus redefines this meal. He totally redefines this meal. With this table setting in mind, right here up here, with this table setting in mind and knowing that what Passover meant to these disciples, Tyler is going to continue to read here in just a moment from Luke chapter 22. And after that reading, we will sing a song, we'll take in communion. And uh, as he reads, I ask that you please notice how Jesus flips the script and redefines what this meal is all about. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until I, it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gives thanks and says, Take this and abide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And when he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, he gave it Give it to them and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as, as it has been done, been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. Other here in Jesus' name, burning in our hearts like living flame. But through the loving heart, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here everyone belongs finding our forgiveness here we in turn forgive the wrong he joins us here he breaks the bread the Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We gather now a family of which the us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Please pray with me. Father God, I just thank you for this time to come here this Sunday morning and to worship you and to um, 
to break the bread in remembrance of you, God, and uh, the sacrifice you made for us. And just thank you for the past that Jacob has brought us, just to think about how it went from the Passover meal to more of the communion focus we do today and how that changed a matter of seconds at a table uh, sitting among the 12 disciples. Just thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray with me. Father God, just thank you for giving your son that died on the cross, that shed his blood for us, that we'd be able to spend eternity with him one day. So as we take up this cup, uh, just, just remind us of the sacrifice he made for us. And it wasn't only just for his sake, but the sake that he wanted us in heaven with him one day. And I just pray that you give us the strength this week to live out uh, the path you have for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 